Hello, welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. Um, so we are almost nearing the end of the sixth week and we have already looked at adaptive control design for a first order scalar system and we are well into the discussion of uh, uh, looking at adaptive control design for second order scalar systems and the rather cool thing uh, is that a lot of mechanical systems including the spacecraft by spacex that you see in the background orbiting the earth um, fall into the category of uh, systems that can be modeled by uh, some kind of nonlinear uh, second order systems right and so what we are uh, already looking at uh, in the sixth week of this course uh, will very much be useful to design algorithms and develop uh, controllers in order to, uh, you know, sort of um, control autonomously or drive autonomously systems such as what you see in a background. So this is where we were last time. And what we had realized was that for the second order system, we sort of hit a detectability obstacle because we started with a non-strict Lyapunov function for the known system case. Yeah. And what it meant was that we could not even prove that the position error in fact converges to zero. All right. So one of the solutions that was well, one of the obvious solutions is to obviously construct a strict Lyapunov function which may not always be easy. However, that's definitely one viable choice. Uh, however, one of the, in fact, more simple solutions was this Ortega construction, right, which was proposed by Romeo Ortega in the 90s. And this is, he in fact proposed uh, a function which was not even a Lyapunov function. So it was like a Lyapunov-like function. And we are starting to look at it from the, in the context of this uh, simple spring mass damper system. It's not the it was e uh, the error system, but the spring mass damper system. Um, and there is no parameter either. There is no parameter error either here. And the aim is to drive uh, you know x one x two to zero as t goes to infinity. And the choice that he proposed was basically something like this: half x two plus alpha x one squared. And we know that this is only positive semi-definite because V of V at K comma minus alpha K is zero for all values of K. Therefore, in fact, along a straight line, yeah, along a particular straight line, this function is zero arbitrarily close to the origin also. And therefore, this is not a positive definite function as per our definition. And hence, not a Lyapunov candidate either. Right. Great. So how do we use this? So this is where we are today. So this is say lecture 6.6. .6. This is where we are. So how do we do? How do we use? It? So we take the derivative of this v and let's x2 plus alpha x1 times x2 dot plus alpha x1 dot. And I simply substitute for the derivatives from our dynamics. So x1 dot is of course x2, so it goes like this. And x2 dot was minus k1 x1 minus k2 x2, which is the standard spring mass damper sort of dynamics. What do we do after that? We sort of club the x2 terms, which is minus k2 minus alpha, and we pull that out here. Okay, so what are we left with? This is retained as it is. Since minus k2 minus alpha is pulled out, the scaling on x2 is identity now. And the scaling on this guy becomes k1 over k2 minus alpha. This is what we have. Now, if we make a choice of k2 such that it is greater than alpha, and I'm allowed to because it's a spring mass damper. If I'm trying to stabilize, I can choose k2 to be anything I want. So if I choose k2 to be greater than alpha, and alpha is also something that I choose. So I have a lot of things that I can tweak. 
and also I choose alpha such that that is exactly equal to this quantity exactly equal to this quantity here yeah. which of course give me some so because this becomes a um, quadratic equation in alpha so I get a viable solution here okay. so if this quantity becomes alpha you see that this whole quantity becomes x2 plus alpha x1 whole square okay. and that's what we write here x2 plus alpha x1 whole squared. On top of that, I have already required, put in the requirement that k2 is greater than alpha. So this quantity is strictly positive. Therefore, this entire quantity is negative semi-definite. Okay. Great. The other cool thing to see is that this exactly looks like the v. So in fact, this is twice of v. And okay. twice of the v function that we chose. So that's what I do that. I, I substitute x2 plus alpha x1 square is twice v. Okay. And I can see that so v is of course a scalar value quantity. So I can see that this is a nice exponential decay in v. Right. There's a nice exponential decay. In fact, I can even solve this. I can even solve this to say that vt is v0 e to the power minus 2 k2 minus alpha t and in terms of x2 plus alpha x1 also i can say that yeah so two things happen one is that this is the v is actually half squared of this and v0 is half squared of this so the halves cancel out and then i take a square root so therefore the two goes away here so that is essentially the exponential decay of v and therefore uh, you know the exponential decay of x2 plus alpha x and of course alpha is also positive quantity so this is what we have this is what we have so so great so great so now we do a little bit of signal chasing type analysis the steps are slightly different here yeah um but they still work out fine yeah so um the first thing is uh v is still lower bounded because v is greater than or equal to zero and it is non-increasing because v dot is less than or equal to zero right i mean even though v is not a lyapunov candidate i still have both of these yeah it is that it's lower bounded and it is non-increasing Therefore, V infinity exists and is finite. Right? V exists plus finite. Right? And then V infinity is what we used to denote this limit of limit of V as T goes to infinity. Okay. So further, because V is uh, X2 plus alpha X1 squared, we know that uh, this is a bounded quantity. Yeah. We can also show that X2 plus alpha X1 is in L2. Right. And x2 dot plus alpha x1 dot is an element. In fact, this step is, I would say, not required because we have already proved that x2 plus alpha x1 goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. Yeah, so we don't need this, don't need this step. This uh, can already be claimed from uh, this can already be claimed from uh, your exponential decay of v and we already did this right because you can see this is the formula for x2 plus alpha x1 at time t so if i take limit as t goes to infinity on both sides this guy is going to zero right so x2 plus alpha x1 is going to zero so what do we know we know two things x2 plus alpha x1 is a bounded signal so let me call this some phi of t defined as that and i know that limit as t goes to infinity phi of t 
is zero. Okay, sorry, not phi of t. I have already called it p of t later on. So. P of t is defined as this and limit as t goes to infinity p of t is c. So I know these two things. Okay. Right? I know these two things. I know further that x2 is equal to x1 dot. So I can rewrite p as also x1 dot plus alpha x. Okay? So what do we do? We now apply the Laplace transform on both sides and do a little bit of rearranging of terms. So how do I do that? Laplace transform here gives me Ps and here I get Sx1 minus x10 and and alpha x1s, which goes to the other side to become minus alpha x1s. Okay. Now, in order to compute x1s, I combine these two and I get x1s as x10 over s plus alpha and Ps over s plus alpha. Just by rearranging and manipulating terms. Now, if I apply the final value theorem, in order to apply the final value theorem, what is it? I know that final value theorem says that limit as t goes to infinity, x of t is basically equal to limit as s goes to 0, s xs. Okay, and that's what we do. Okay. So, I multiply s on both sides and take limit as s goes to 0. So, I get from the left hand side, I get limit as s goes to 0, sx1s, which is actually this quantity. Yeah. And further, and of course, I can, uh, on the right hand side, I have this guy. Now, what do I know about this? I also know that p goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. So, from here, I immediately have that, again, by the final value theorem. That limit as s goes to 0, s times p of s is 0. All right. Great. Now, notice this is what is there here in the numerator. Right? So, when I take the limit here as s goes to 0, I can distribute it in the numerator in the denominator. So, the denominator as s goes to 0 is alpha, and the numerator limit as s goes to 0 is 0. Therefore, the outcome is in fact 0. And here it is just 0 because there is an s here, this is some constant, and this becomes alpha. So basically, the limit here is 0. So what have we shown is that x1, yeah, uh, let's see, right, yeah, yeah, what we have shown is that x1 in fact goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. And that's what by final value theorem. Further, we already know p goes to 0 as t goes to infinity and p is x2 plus alpha x1. Now, if I take limit on both sides of this, yeah, so if I take limit as t goes to infinity on both sides of this, what do I know? I know that this guy is going to 0, I know this guy is going to 0. Therefore, x2 has to go to 0 as t goes to infinity. All right. There is no two ways about that. Right? So, what have we been able to show? We've been able to show that both x1 and x2, there are a couple of things. One is we've been able to show that both x1 and x2 go to 0. Okay. Now, what about boundedness? It's not mentioned here, yeah, but it's also important for our trajectories uh, or our uh, states to remain bounded. Okay. Now, we can do this in separate two separate ways. I mean, you can you can choose another Lyapunov function, which is uh, say v bar equals half um, the same thing as before k1 x1 square plus x2 square, and we have v bar dot is minus k2 x2 square from this dynamics, right? Just by substituting for the dynamics of the spring mass damper from the previous example, I know that this is exactly what I get and this is less than or equal to 0 and this will immediately imply that x1, x2 uniformly stable at the origin. Okay, so stability can be obtained if you want by this earlier Lyapunov candidate, which is actually a Lyapunov candidate. So I don't have to worry about stability that was already given to me, but, but this particular 
Lyapunov like construction actually gave me convergence. Right? I can claim that x1, x2 go to 0 as it goes to infinity. So I even got my nice asymptotic terminals also. All right. Great. Great. So what we want to do is we want to use the same idea for the adaptive control problem. Right. So um, we already had this sort of a control and we already had the original dynamics. And of course, we had the error dynamics, which was exactly like this. And now instead of choosing k1 x k1 e1 squared plus e2 squared, we choose this as a Lyapunov function or a uh, I will not call it Lyapunov function, but the Lyapunov like function. It is the Lyapunov like function. It is not a Lyapunov function. I use this guy. Yeah, because this is not a positive definite quantity. All right. Great. And now we again take the time derivative just like before. So I get e2, e2 plus alpha e1, e2 dot plus alpha e1 dot, and this quantity just moves. So this guy just remains as it is all through. Okay. Because we are yet to choose the theta hat dot. So we choose the theta hat dot every time by taking the Lyapunov candidate or a Lyapunov like function. And from the derivative, you know, we try to choose the theta hat dot so that v is at least negative semi definite. So v dot is at least negative semi definite. Right? That's really the idea. So again, we substitute for e2 dot and e1 dot. e1 dot is just e2, and e2 dot is this entire thing. Yeah. So wait a second. This is not correct. e2 dot is in fact plus theta tilde. This end. Okay. So this is what is e2 dot. Okay. And then what do we do? We again, uh, if you notice, I still get minus k2 minus alpha here. So I take this minus k2 minus alpha common and I get e2 plus alpha even as it is. And the second term, yeah, we, we choose by appropriate choice of alpha. Yeah, and uh, with k2 greater than alpha, you will get this sort of term. But if you are confused, you can simply write this as minus k2 minus alpha, e2 plus alpha e1. It is the same calculation as before uh, e2 plus k1 over k2 minus alpha e1 okay that that is what becomes of uh, all these terms yeah except for this theta tilde term yeah so everything except the theta tilde term becomes this yeah so therefore if we choose k2 greater than alpha and, and alpha equal to this guy we will get here. So these terms become this. Yeah, great. And the theta tilde term, we club the two theta tilde terms together. So I take the theta tilde common, yeah, here, and I get e2 plus alpha e1 times f, right? And here I get theta hat dot over c. So now, Notice that we have to choose a different update law. Yeah. The update law here is now this guy. Earlier, if you notice with the previous uh, Lyapunov candidate, the theta hat dot only contained the E2. Okay, but now it has E2 and alpha E1 both. It has E2 and alpha E1 both. Okay. So, so that's what, and of course, I mean, there we use the gamma for the adaptation game. Here you use the sigma, that's fine. Yeah. So, of course, sigma is also some positive adaptation gain. So, that shows up here. So, once we choose that, this term essentially vanishes and we are left with this guy. Okay. This is also negative semi definite. Yeah. Remember, we did not do any new magic. We did not. So, so what happens? Is that v dot is again the same as what you have in the non adaptive case, even though the v may have started different. Okay, so this is still the same negative semi definite v dot. Okay, but what do we know now? Yeah, so here the steps are slightly different. Whatever I had, you know, I had said here that 
this step is not required and this step is not required but now we will require these steps we will yeah why because this is not v anymore the right hand side is not v anymore yeah v will contain also the theta tilde squared okay so i cannot use directly the expression for v so that's what we say hence we won't be right v dot as minus gamma v as in the known parameter case so we use signal chasing arguments so what is it uh so this is where we use the earlier arguments we know that uh, i i'm going to write those here to be honest yeah because we said we don't need that yeah so i will write these steps a b and c so what is step a v infinity uh, so v greater than equal to zero v dot less than equal to zero implies v infinity exists plus finite then the second step is that uh, e2 plus alpha e1 and theta tilde are both bounded yeah because that's up that is in the v yeah and v is non-increasing therefore both e2 plus alpha e1 and theta tilde are bounded the third step is e2 plus alpha e1 is l2 why that can be obtained by integrating this guy from 0 to infinity and i can i can do this because v infinity exists and is finite and we just showed that and further finally we can write that e2 plus alpha e1 the derivative of that is also bounded yeah how this compute the derivative e2 dot plus alpha e1 dot in fact it is exactly this guy here inside the bracket this is e2 dot plus alpha e1 dot and everything here e1 uh, well i mean after taking this k2 minus alpha common you will get and with, with this sort of a choice essentially you will have e2 plus alpha e1 the derivative will be from here um it will be let's see uh, e2 wait a second it is minus k2 minus alpha times e2 plus alpha e1 plus 1 over k2 minus yeah, plus 1 over k2 minus alpha theta tilde f. Yeah, so this is what we will have. And so now I know that e2 plus alpha e1 is bounded, theta tilde is bounded. If I assume boundedness on f, I have also that the derivative is bounded. Okay, therefore the derivative is bounded. So simply by the Babalat's, the corollary to the Babalat's lemma, I can claim this e2 plus alpha e1 goes to 0 as t goes to infinity okay and i also know that e2 plus alpha e1 is bounded so i have the exact same thing right okay. so i have the exact same thing as before yeah so now i do the same i can do the same steps right i can i can say the same steps right if i so what do i know suppose i define p of t as e2 t plus alpha e1 t i know that p of t belongs to l infinity and i know that limit as t goes to infinity p of t is identically zero okay excellent and i also know that p of t can also be written as e1 dot t plus alpha e1 t okay then i can use the same final value theorem arguments like by taking laplace transform here so this is ps s e1 s minus e1 0 plus alpha e1 s and so i will get e1 s as uh, s e1 s as s 
um, E1 0 over S plus alpha plus S times PS divided by S plus alpha. Okay, so if I take the limit as S goes to 0 on both sides, I know that this is going to 0, I know that this is going to 0. So basically, I have this is equal to 0. Yeah, so which means that uh, implies that E1 is going to 0 as T goes to infinity. And because P is also going to 0, and P is E2 plus alpha E1, so I also have that E2 is going to 0 as T goes to infinity. And that's exactly what we want. Okay, that is exactly what we want for the adaptive case. All right, that's exactly what we want for the adaptive case. So notice that there was a change in how I chose the V, v function, which is now a Lyapun of like function. And there was of course a change in how we update theta hat dot because we changed the V. Right. As soon as you change the V, remember that the update law was always obtained by computing the V dot and trying to make it negative semi-definite. Yeah. And so it's obvious that if I change the V, the choice of V, the choice of the update law, of course, changes. Yeah. So it's not like I'm getting conversions of the tracking errors to zero for free. Yeah, because this is just analysis, right? After all, choosing a V and doing derivative and substituting dynamics is the analysis. One might ask, what did I actually change in the controller? So I did. The controller remained exactly the same, but the update for the theta hat changed. And with this change in the update, using the same sort of steps that I did for the known case using this, uh, you know, Ortega construction, I could actually show that both E1 and E2 are now going to go to 0 as t goes to infinity. Right? By the way, this sort of proof that we did that if E1 dot plus alpha E1 goes to 0 as t goes to infinity, this proof can also be done in the time domain. Okay, It's not impossible to do this proof in the time domain. Yeah, Because this is a nice exponential dk nice system with, with this is a nice exponential decaying system with a bounded dying or bounded vanishing perturbation yeah so this sort of analysis can also be done yeah i mean i would strongly encourage you to look at how to prove the same thing without the final value theorem and going to the s domain or the laplace domain yeah i would strongly urge you to try to do this simply by uh, directly integrating this system yeah, because this is just a bounded vanishing perturbation on an exponentially stable system all right excellent so so that's great so this uh, sort of brings us to the end of uh, this week's lectures and uh, we have done rather interesting things we have seen our first set of adaptive control problems we saw that how to do the first order case start with the unknown case well, right, start with the known case, use certainty equivalence to design a control for the unknown case and then come up with an update law using a appropriately happen of candidate function. And we also show how to choose the candidate function. But as soon as we move to the second order system, we saw that it's not very difficult to hit a detectability obstacle if you end up choosing a non-strictly happen of function for the original system. All right, so it's not that complicated or that uh, difficult to get to a detectability obstacle. And then we also saw a means of alleviating the detectability obstacle by choosing what we call the Ortega construction, which is essentially a Lyapunov-like function, uh, which still helps you with the signal chasing analysis for these kind of uh, integrator type systems. So you essentially have an integrator type system. If it was not an integrator type system, this sort of construction may not work. You might need to use a strict Lyapunov construction. But then with this type of Ortega construction, we showed that with the uh, second order scalar system, we are able to, in fact, uh, make a nice adaptive control design and show that both the tracking errors go to zero. As always, we don't claim anything on the parameter error. We, of course, show that it's bounded. 
but we don't claim anything on whether it is converging or not to the true value. All right. And this, of course, brings in notions of persistence of excitation. We looked at that for the first order scalar case. We did not look at it uh, for the second order scalar case, but it's similar. You can do a very similar thing for the second order case also and uh, probably use persistence results that we've discussed before to claim that under uh, rich enough um, trajectories, you will be able to identify the parameter. But how to find the rich enough trajectories, how many frequencies do you need in the trajectory, these are all still uh, heuristics. It's more like trial and error. Yeah. And like we've already discussed, it may not always be possible in a real ex application to create these you know, arbitrarily oscillating trajectories because you may not want your robot to follow such trajectories. Excellent. Uh, so I hope it was a very interesting um, week six, uh, interesting excursion into the start of the design process and so henceforth we will see more and more of the design so i'm very hopeful that you will be able to pick up tools from here and start applying to these small tiny problems that all of you are probably already uh, trying to solve in your own you know fields of work thanks a lot and i'll see you again soon